Okay, it's two o'clock, so with any uh, luck, our uh, tech chap in France, or the church's tech chap, Tony, will be switching us on now. First of all, if there's a fire, the exits are behind you. And secondly, good afternoon. I'm Tim Deverett, Chair of Movement for the Abolition of War. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all those of you here in this lovely Welsh church in central London, and those of you online. It's also a great pleasure to welcome Kate Hudson as our speaker for the Movement of Abolition of Wars 2022 Remembrance Lecture. As I looked on the internet for information about Kate, I was particularly pleased to hit, see her response to the question, who is the campaigner you most admire? Bruce Kent. <laughs> Kate Hudson's been General Secretary of CND since 2010, having served as Chair since 2003. She first became active in the peace movement in the early 1980s in the big upsurge of activity against cruise missiles. One of her proudest moments was helping to embrace the base at Greenham Common in December 1982, along with 30,000 other women. With the end of the Cold War, like many others, Kate felt the issue of nuclear weapons had gone away, so she turned to other campaigning work. But by the mid-1990s, with the expansion of NATO, an escalation of US Star Wars system, she came back into CND activity and into CND leadership, just as the war on terror was beginning. She's been a key figure in the anti-war movement, nationally and internationally, and considers international cooperation and solidarity to be the key to our ultimate success. By profession, a historian, Kate was head of social policy and policy studies at London South Bank University prior to working for CND. She's the author of a number of books, including A History of CND. If you know the CND website off by heart, you might recognize a few of those words. So now, Kate, over to you. Nuclear risks in the light of the Ukraine war. Thanks very much indeed, Tim, and thanks to you all for inviting me here today to give this talk. And I'd like to dedicate this lecture to the memory of Bruce Kent who was such a great guide and inspiration to me and, of course, to so many others. In 2022, the existential threat of nuclear war has shifted from being an abstract fear to an increasing possibility. In January, the hands on the doomsday clock remained at 100 seconds to midnight, their closest ever, but since then, we have seen a hugely increased risk of nuclear war and nuclear power disaster in the context of the Ukraine conflict. CND's messaging and that of the wider peace movement has been as strong as ever. Nuclear war cannot be allowed to take place. We are also calling for a new approach to security in Europe and beyond, common security for all. In this, we share ground with the peace movement internationally, which is welcoming a renewal of the message of the great Olaf Palme, that cooperation can provide the security that humans crave, where military competition and nuclear weapons fail. That, ultimately, states and populations can only feel safe when their counterparts feel safe. And there is much need of such an approach the first war in Europe for two decades has seen death, injury, destruction and displacement on a terrible scale. The illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine has unleashed disaster on the people of Ukraine and the wider world too, as energy and food prices have gone sky high, particularly affecting parts of the global south. And at the same time, the other existential threat, the climate emergency, has accelerated, leading to significant loss of life and destruction of livelihoods and natural habitats. 
Britain has also faced huge economic problems that have caused a cost of living crisis, as well as the continued impact of the pandemic and political turmoil on an extraordinary scale. Navigating these multiple crises has been difficult for all of us, but very clear themes are coming clear weapons can ultimately make us safe. Of course, this sentiment is not confined to the peace movement. We know that the global south is almost entirely self-organized into nuclear weapons-free zones, and they have led the way on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. These are states and peoples dedicated to abolishing the nuclear threat. We also heard the wise words of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres this summer as he warned that the world is, quotes, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. Speaking in New York at the opening of the NPT Review Conference, he said that we are in a time of nuclear danger not seen since the height of the Cold War. He warned against countries seeking false security by spending vast sums on doomsday weapons and said that so far we have been extraordinarily lucky that nuclear weapons have not been used again since 1945. But as he rightly stated, luck is not a strategy, nor is it a shield from geopolitical tensions boiling over into nuclear conflict. Absolutely. At the start of this year, we also heard that message from the leaders of the nuclear weapons states, including those who are currently talking about the possibility of nuclear weapons use. We affirm, they said, that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. That was the leaders of the world's largest nuclear weapons states in their joint statement issued in preparation for the delayed NPT review conference. They were echoing Reagan and Gorbachev, of course, but without taking the necessary steps to bring about any change. Of course, what they said was right. Yet just months later, we were in a situation which continues and has worsened, where we face the very serious possibility of the use of nuclear weapons. Writing at the time, we welcomed the leader's stated commitment to increasing mutual understanding and confidence and to prevent an arms race that would benefit none and endanger all. But we also stated that we would welcome their engagement with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, freely negotiated by the global majority. And events that have folded in, unfolded in the months since then have surely shown us that the only sure way to prevent nuclear war is indeed to abolish nuclear weapons. Words, no matter how fine, can be rendered meaningless from one day to the next. Since the 24th of February, we have lived in an entirely new situation. Many of us here have been involved in peace campaigning for decades against terrible wars in which many lives have been destroyed. But this is a uniquely dangerous situation because never before has the world been at such great risk of nuclear war. Now you may be thinking, what about Hiroshima? What about the Cuban Missile Crisis? Of course, but I don't think that I'm exaggerating. When the US used two atom bombs in 1945 on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, an estimated 340,000 people died as a result from the immediate impact and over subsequent years from radiation. That was a catastrophe and an unnecessary catastrophe, indeed a crime, because Japan was already trying to surrender. But at that time, only the US had nuclear weapons. There was no possibility of a nuclear war breaking out. And then if you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it seemed that the world was on the brink of disaster, the two leaders, Kennedy and Khrushchev, had the wisdom to negotiate, to bring about a solution which dealt with the security concerns of both sides. Wisdom and dialogue prevailed, and nuclear war was averted. 
But look at the situation now. What are the unique factors that make nuclear war so much more likely? Firstly, there is a terrible and brutal war taking place in Ukraine. People are dying, homes and infrastructure torn apart. We are right to be so outraged, to want this war to stop. A war like this is the context in which nuclear weapons could become the next stage in military escalation. Secondly, the calls for peace, the negotiation, the concern for saving every human life that we should be hearing from our leaders are absent. What we've been hearing, even when it was still possible to prevent this war, is bellicose rhetoric, followed by escalatory movements of troops, weaponry and munitions that can only make matters infinitely worse. We've seen the most heartbreaking coverage of the sufferings of the Ukrainian people, and our hearts go out to them. But at the same time, we have experienced wall-to-wall -wall coverage promoting warfare, even encouraging people to go and fight. Every single death is a tragedy, and the media and politicians who suggest otherwise and pursue policies that will lead to more slaughter should be ashamed of themselves. But now we're told that people are tired of hearing about the war, that there is a kind of war fatigue and saturation where the tragic events become just another bad news story. The danger is that the war may yet turn into a nuclear catastrophe that will affect us all, yet getting people to engage with what that risk really means is very difficult. Those of us here today well understand what the reality of nuclear war would be. The heart of a nuclear explosion reaches a temperature of several million degrees centigrade. This results in a heat flash over a wide area, vaporizing all human tissue. Beyond this central area, people are killed by heat and blast waves, with buildings collapsing and bur bursting into flame. The firestorm creates hurricane force winds spreading and intensifying the fire. As in Hiroshima, many who survived the immediate blast died short shortly afterwards from fatal burns. Others died because of the complete breakdown of rescue and medical services, which had themselves been destroyed. Then radiation kicks in with symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and hair loss. Most of these victims died within a week. With radiation, there is no place to run to, no place to hide. If you escape the blast, you cannot shut the door on radiation. It poisons and destroys, it brings sickness, cancers, birth deformities, and death. And that is the least that we can expect from nuclear use. Because as if that isn't bad enough, the Hiroshima bomb was actually a small bomb in today's terms. Some of today's nuclear weapons are a hundred times the power of the Hiroshima bomb that exploded with the power of approximately 15 kilotons of TNT. In today's parlance, the Hiroshima bomb would be described as low yield. Many of the world's larger warheads weigh in at 800 kilotons, with the UK's arsenal each at 100, or around eight times the power of the Hiroshima bomb. Can you imagine what that would do to London? Yet in the early months of the war, Mayor Sadiq Khan's office said that London is well prepared if Putin launches a nuclear attack. Such a statement takes one's breath away. There is no way to be prepared for a nuclear attack. You have to stop it happening. And of course, the recent policies of nuclear weapons states are not making it easy. For some decades, we had seen gradual reductions in nuclear weapons, but now we are seeing modernization programs on all sides, like Britain's Trident Replacement. In some cases, we are even seeing increases 
like Boris Johnson's nuclear arsenal increase last year. But worst of all is the sanitizing of the idea of nuclear use. Former President Trump had a lot to answer for this. He not only talked of so-called usable nuclear weapons, he also produced them and deployed them in his last year of office. President Biden's recently published nuclear posture review has confirmed that the US will retain these weapons in spite of statements to the contrary during his election campaign. So now the idea that they will never be used the mutually assured destruction theory of the Cold War, has gone. We hear of tactical nuclear weapons, as if you could use a small one on a battlefield and everything would be fine elsewhere. This is complete nonsense, and I believe that it's criminally dangerous nonsense. So what can our leaders be thinking? In the early months of the war, there was talk of no-fly zones over Ukraine. Yet those who were piling on the pressure for this, often senior figures in government and parliament and from the military establishment, must have known that this would constitute escalation to actual direct war between nuclear powers. That would have been the outcome if a NATO-enforced no-fly zone had shot down a Russian plane. Fortunately, that has not come to pass. And as one of our peace activist friends from Ukraine has said, we believe this brutal invasion should be stopped, but we strongly oppose reckless demands to close the sky. There are 12,000 nuclear weapons held by NATO states, US, France and UK, and Russia with delivery systems capable of intercontinental delivery, these could all be focused on Ukraine. But within minutes, they can also fire on London, New York, Paris, Moscow, and indeed pretty much anywhere else. The one thing we can be sure of is that having nuclear weapons makes you a target. The US also has around 150 B61 free fall nuclear bombs. In other words, they're dropped from planes. They are located across Europe and assigned to NATO. They are currently being modernized and they have a variable yield currently ranging from 0.3 kilotons to 170 kilotons and allow for both strategic and tactical use. That could be described essentially as long and short range. In the event of a nuclear exchange with Ukraine, I think these are the most likely to be used, certainly to start off with. So a Russia-US nuclear war could be fought in Europe. That was our worst fear in the 1980s, when millions mobilized across Europe against cruise and Pershing missiles. In the 1980s, we got rid of all those weapons, and we have to have the energy, the commitment, and the confidence to do that again. The particularly bad news for us is that these US free-fall nuclear bombs are coming back to Britain, most likely next month, to RAF Lakenheath, in East Anglia. This is sometimes called by activists USAF Lakenheath because the Americans run and completely control the base. 110 B61 bombs were sighted there until 2008 when they were removed following sustained protest by CND and local peace campaigners. The news of the return was revealed in a tweet by nuclear expert Hans Christensen, director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. He was scrutinizing a recent US Department of Defense document justifying its 2023 budget plans to Congress. It had added the UK to the list of European sites in line for infrastructure investment 
for storing special weapons within secure sites and facilities. Now, special weapons means nuclear weapons. The Department of Defense claims there is a need to improve NATO infrastructure within alliance territories in the context of increasing tension with Russia and the current escalating war. The UK was not on the comparable list for the previous year, so this looks like a very recent decision. Since the weapons were removed in 2008, the empty storage vaults for the weapons have been on what's called caretaker status, but there have been recent reports of nuclear exercises at Lakenheath. And this increases the likelihood that nuclear weapons are on their way, although Christensen didn't rule out the possibility they might have already returned. The base currently hosts F-15E fighter bombers with nuclear capability, but these are being replaced by the new nuclear-capable F-35A Lightning. The first of these new fighter bombers arrived at the end of last year. US NATO nuclear bases in Europe will also receive the new B-61-12 guide nuclear bomb, which is in full-scale production in the US. Parliamentary CND, the cross-party group, immediately asked questions of the Ministry of Defence. Initially, the response was that it was, quote, unable to comment on US spending decisions and capabilities, which are a matter for the US government. It remains long-standing UK and NATO policy to neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons at a given location as if another country's nuclear weapons coming to Britain isn't a matter for our government and parliament. Understandably, MPs were outraged at the lack of accountability. Subsequently, the government has responded that construction work at Lakenheath is taking place with the US footing the costs with minimal expenditure by the UK government. All other information, they said, was covered by official secrets. CND has opposed any return of US nukes to Lakenheath, and we make the case that these weapons will put Britain on the front line in any US war. We're working with movements in other countries that also host these same B-61 bombs. That's Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, and Turkey. And the weapons are stationed in those countries in spite of strong opposition to them in many of these countries, including at governmental level. We organized a successful protest at Lakenheath in May, and we will also be there next Saturday if anyone would like to attend. We also have EDM 98, put down by parliamentary CND. So if you have time, please do urge your MP to sign up. Putting this into the wider global picture shows us how dangerous this is. The return of US nuclear weapons to Britain and the upgrading of its nuclear weapons across Europe is a further undermining of prospects for peace in the region. And the US is the only country to locate its nuclear weapons outside its own borders. And this major increase in NATO's capacity to wage nuclear war in Europe is dangerously destabilizing. Britain's own role in exacerbating the nuclear problem is significant and growing. <coughs> Last year, the government announced an increase in the UK's nuclear arsenal of over 40%, and also an increase in the scenarios in which they would be used, including against non-nuclear weapon states and against threats, even including such things as cyber attack. This increase reverses decades of gradual reductions, and it goes against our international treaty obligations, and it also contributes to a new nuclear arms race. As the invasion of Ukraine began on the 24th of February, 
around 1,000 Russian nuclear weapons and a similar number of US, British and French nuclear forces assigned to NATO were already on prompt launch, high alert status. This is the normal situation. Most high alert missiles are armed with strategic nuclear weapons with yields of at least 100 kilotons. They can be launched in 15 minutes and the nominal flight time of intercontinental ballistic missiles carrying these weapons traveling between the US and Russia is around 30 minutes. Two months ago, Putin escalated his nuclear threats, saying he would use all available means to defend Russian territory. And soon after, President Biden delivered a blunt warning that the war in Ukraine could evolve into a nuclear Armageddon. According to the New York Times reports, senior American officials say they have seen no evidence that Mr. Putin is moving any of his nuclear assets, especially in Russia's stockpile of about 2,000 small tactical weapons. Biden recently said that the United States would respond forcefully if Putin uses a tactical nuclear weapon and that any use of nuclear weapons in this conflict on any scale would entail severe consequences. His national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, said on September the 25th there would be catastrophic consequences and those had been communicated to Moscow. But apparently that does not necessarily mean a retaliatory nuclear strike which could trigger a broader war. For months, administration officials have said they could think of almost no circumstances in which a nuclear detonation by Russia in Ukraine would result in a nuclear response from the United States. But of course, that hasn't prevented newspaper headlines and commentators warning of World War III. In subsequent comments, Putin appears to have pulled back from threatening nuclear use. It is profoundly to be hoped that this position holds. The news that the US and Russia are taking steps towards negotiating a replacement for the new START treaty, that's the Bilateral Nuclear Weapons Reduction Treaty signed by Obama and Medvedev in 2010, is very good news. And it is to be hoped that it will open the door for further negotiations. Beyond this crucial concern, the war is having other serious impacts, including economic, particularly affecting energy and food production and supplies. Significantly, it has already altered the political balance in Europe and is accelerating its militarization. This will have a profoundly negative impact on our societies engendering a culture of violence and nationalism. For years, there had been talk of the increasing militarization of the EU, encouraged by the US, basically to input more resources into NATO. There had been little progress, but that has now changed. Germany, for example, has undertaken a huge about turn towards war and militarism. So more and more of the people's money will be squandered on weapons and war instead of on health, jobs and education. It has often been said that NATO is the means by which the US makes Europe pay for its wars and its attempts at global military hegemony. That is more so the case than ever and it brings with it ever greater dangers of nuclear annihilation. In June, NATO heads of state met in Madrid for this year's summit meeting. As expected, a new strategic concept was unveiled, setting NATO's evolving global development in the context of the war in Ukraine. While the long-term orientation towards a military build-up in the Indo-Pacific to counter China continues, 
there is an intensification of focus on Russia and Eastern Europe in particular, including a substantial increase in military forces in the latter. Significant stress is laid on Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which provides for collective defence. An attack on one is an attack on all. The open door policy has been reaffirmed, with the membership of Sweden and Finland endorsed, and others potentially welcomed further down the line. This is a very dangerous step, particularly given the role that NATO expansion had in triggering the current war. Taken together with an escalating militarization across our societies, the summit outcomes indicated a deepening preparation for major war in Europe or beyond. The great danger we all face is that this preparation for war actually increases the risk of war. Nowhere is this more worryingly spelled out than in NATO's new chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear defence policy, published alongside the new strategic concept. This underpins NATO's, quote, defence and deterrence posture and states that, quote, allies will have all the appropriate tools to ensure that potential adversaries do not perceive that they can gain a clear advantage against NATO by using or threatening to use CBRN materials. Rather than following the path pursued through the TPNW of recognising that nuclear weapons are so dangerous they must be outlawed, NATO has clearly decided that nukes are so dangerous that we must have a lot more of them. The additional problem is that NATO suffers from the delusion that we can be made safe from them. As their report says, NATO's populations, territories and forces will be defended and secure against the threat or use of chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear materials and weapons of mass destruction. As we said before, with reference to London's security, how can that possibly be the case? To revert to a slogan from previous times, no nukes is good nukes. Mm. And the global majority agree with that. When peace activists from around the world gathered in Madrid for the peace summit while NATO was having its own summit, they discussed an alternative vision of global security and strategies for moving forward together. Their message was clear in the statement they agreed together and which I wholeheartedly recommend to you today. They said, together we can work for a different security order based on dialogue, cooperation, disarmament, common and human security. This is not only desirable but necessary if we want to preserve the planet from threats and challenges posed by nuclear weapons, climate change and poverty. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody with a question? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, what I know. Oh, okay. Um, that Putin had asked to join NATO but was turned down. So I'm not sure, I haven't actually heard about Putin applying, but I know that in the 1990s, um, after the end of the Soviet Union, the dismantlement of the Warsaw Pact, uh, NATO had actually started to have what they call partnerships for peace uh, with other countries, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, which were seen as kind of staging posts to full membership of NATO, which of course happened with most of the countries of Eastern Europe and some of the former Soviet republics. Um, Russia also had a partnership for peace program 
Um, but that broke down uh, later in the 1990s. I don't remember exactly now what it was. I think it might have actually been over the war on Yugoslavia, you know, the NATO attack on, on, Yugos on the former, what remained of the former Yugoslavia. And I think that since then, that kind of formal arrangement for the process of joining NATO hasn't existed. But of course, they are together in the various European cooperation bodies, you know, so there are many places in which um, Russia intersects with NATO powers on the military front and various other security fronts. Um, he may well have asked, um, so, but I, I don't personally know the details, but I think what would have made and it would have transformed the global situation was if in the early 1990s when the Warsaw Pact was dissolved, that NATO had been dissolved at the same time. You know, they, they existed in relation to each other. You know, the Warsaw Pact was founded because NATO was set up. So you'd imagine that with the Cold War over, all that gone, that they should have dissolved and, and money and resources could have been put into the OSCE, for example, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and developed in a different way. But unfortunately, the NATO agenda, for whatever reason, was to uh, expand into Eastern Europe and beyond. And of course, it's not only Eastern Europe, it's NATO is now pretty much global as an organization. It's got a kind of partner state in Latin America, it's active in Africa and various other places, and through its bilateral alliances, active in Southeast Asia as well. You know, so. It's gone from kind of strength to strength, so to speak. Um, so a different approach in the 1990s would have made the world of difference. Uh, can I ask, when, when you ask a question, if you could give your name, that would be nice. Yes, David. No, I, I, I'm David. Um, yes, when I'm feeling optimistic, I think that, um, yeah, I do think that that's possible. I think sometimes it doesn't seem very probable, but the reality is that the overwhelming majority of global states and peoples have the same view as us. That is, that is the truth, you know, all the um, nuclear weapons-free zones in the global south, their leadership you know, they reached a brick wall essentially with the NPT, so the kind of formation of the TPNW to try and break through the logjam of the nuclear weapons states by other countries kind of doing it for themselves, you know, and every month there are new signatories and ratifiers to that treaty. I suppose the question for everybody is, if you've got the nuclear holdouts, as they're called, you know, who are refusing to recognise it, you know, how, how much headway can be made. Now, when people ask questions like that, other people who feel very positive about it are very convincing, and they've certainly convinced me. You know, there are ways in which that treaty, even if it's not actually some states, there are, um, that will have an, have an impact on their nuclear weapons production and movement, for example, and then it becoming eventually customary, customary law through the UN, which will mean that even though they're not signed up to it, they will be impacted on it legally. You know, so I think there are, it, it's a remarkable treaty and just to say, one of the things that I feel incredibly strongly about is its inclusion in um, environmental remediation around nuclear weapons testing and also the um, support for communities and veterans as well who've been impacted by nuclear weapons testing. You know, so there are so many marvellous things. So I suppose the quest one of the questions for us is, you know, living in a nuclear weapons state, which is, you know, 
increasing its nuclear arsenal and all that and behaving badly internationally. You know, what can we do to help bring our government on side or at least to get it further up the agenda? And there has been some very good development around um, the nuclear ban communities initiative with councils and cities and so on, mayors signing up in support. You know, so I think the more that we do on the ground as local communities and civil society, then we can help to really push that forward and support all those states that have already seen what's necessary and brought that treaty forward. Anyone else? I, I have a question. Well, I have two questions, actually. But the first one, the Welsh Nationalists, the Scottish Nationalists, the Green Party have uh, a plan to abandon nuclear weapons. Do you see any prospect that any of the larger parties might get on board with that rather sensible idea? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> that's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, I'll, I'll start off with um, the Labour Party. Um, well, as, as we know, um, the Labour Party on a couple of occasions in its history has been anti-nuclear weapons, I think, in the early 60s, I think, was it? And then, of course, again in the early 1980s. Um, but apart from that, unfortunately, it has been pretty much gung-ho for nuclear weapons. I mean, including being the government which actually began the nuclear weapons project in the first place, and also, by the way, being the government which took Britain into NATO. So the idea that it's so more socially progressive than the other major political party, you know, and has been responsible for many good things, like the welfare state, doesn't seem to mean, it doesn't seem to add up that they have a better attitude internationally. Um, and one of the things that, well, I suppose a couple of things became clear to me over the past few years. One is that even if you have a leader of the Labour Party who is a member of CND, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean that you can change Labour Party policy. And he was just... Jeremy Corbyn, of course, was just prevented, out and out prevented from taking his, not only taking his personal views, you know, onto the top, top table, so to speak, you know, but he was also prevented from that going to Labour Party conference for discussion. Because before he was in, in, in the leadership, you know, we would put in motions to Labour Party conference and they would get ruled out of order. So when he was leader, we thought, oh, well, maybe we'll actually get a debate. No, it was kind of almost double ruled out of order. And I suppose what, what um, is clear is that, well, maybe, well, I suppose there are two issues. One is the, the question of jobs. So there, are, there is a kind of strong lobby on the Labour Party from some of the major trade unions that have workforce in nuclear and the arms industry, so there's that. But I think, for me, the major thing that's stopping them even thinking about it is that they have the idea that if they are seen to be soft on defence, they will not be elected into government. And I think that that has been... It's a myth actually, it's completely wrong, but they have that idea. Even though, um, so for example, during the debate on Trident replacement, you know, for like a decade, during that debate, um, overwhelmingly, continually, there was a significant majority against replacing Trident, you know, and the breakdown of votes, um, you know, po polling showed that um, in social classes um, A and B, they were more likely to be pro-nuclear. In social classes C to D and E, they were more likely to be anti-nuclear. You know, so you think if the Labour Party looked at that, they would see, well, actually, a majority of people are against nuclear weapons, and our constituent target voters of working class people and the less wealthy are actually even more against nuclear weapons, you think they would think, okay, well actually, let's be courageous, let's try and turn this round 
and let's, you know, change our policy on nuclear. But no, they sort of double down on the Tories, and if they ever, Tories ever made a, make a cut in the army or anything like that, they're really on their case accusing them of being soft on defence and so on. So I feel as though it's, it's kind of a kind of political football almost, you know, that, that is just used, not because they all love nukes necessarily, but because they think it's not politically expedient to oppose them. Um, which I think is absolutely disgraceful, to be honest. And, and it's not just polls from the past, you know, 10 years ago or so about Trident replacement. When the TPNW was brought in, we commissioned polling, which showed that a majority of everybody, that's across all demographics, all party members of all parties and all supporters of all parties, the majority was for the abolition of nuclear weapons and uh, slightly less, but still a majority, thought Britain should sign up to the TPNW. You know, so it's, like, it's there, ready <laughs> for Labour or another party to kind of really seize, let's do things differently, you know, but they just, they just don't do that. Um, and I, you kind of, I mean, I remember uh, John Cox, who's one of CND's vice presidents, used to be um, uh, chair, he, he once said, you know, you'd have better luck. You'll have better luck trying to change the Tories on nuclear weapons than you will Labour, because the Tories don't feel they have to prove anything on this. You know, so they could sort of say, OK, well, actually, we'll be more safe without. We'll put more money into other stuff instead. They would probably get away with it, you know, but maybe they have too much invested in the, the weapons manufacturers, you know. But... Um, Obviously, we carry on doing the work. There's a strong Labour CND specialist section within the Labour Party who are very active around that. There's Green CND. We work very closely with the uh, Lib Dems uh, against nuclear weapons group who are um, good in trying to change um, Lib Dem policy. Actually, Lib Dem policy is much better than Labour policy on this because Labour policy is just plain pro whereas Lib Dem policy is for a reduction in nuclear subs, you know, and taking them off continuous mm -hmm. alert sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, in other words. <laughs> Sally. Yeah, Sally Reynolds. Um, whenever nuclear weapons are mentioned, just, you know, socially or wherever, someone always says... Yeah, of course we want to get rid of nuclear weapons, but we can't because nuclear weapons have kept the peace for the last 75 ah. years. Mm. What's your reply to that? Well, I, I probably couldn't fit the list of wars <laughs> since 1945 on my 11 sheets of paper, to be honest. You know, so many people have been killed. And um, e even, if, even if you thought, well kind of a world war has been prevented, you know, even if you thought that, and even if, yeah, even if you thought that and said they will never be used, you know, and all that sort of thing that we used to be told, if that was ever the case, it is certainly no longer the case because of the production with, of usable nukes, you know, explicitly called usable nukes, you know, and all the discussions now about how you would use them and where. I mean, it used to be that in Britain's security policies and strategic reviews and all that, they didn't talk about using nuclear weapons. It was sort of the weapon of last resort that, you know, if we were being attacked, blah, blah, blah. That's not in there anymore. Now, as I mentioned, there's this increasing list of when they would be used, even against countries that don't have nuclear weapons, and even against non-nuclear threats, you know, and not only chemical or biological threats, which you could say, well, they're weapons of mass destruction, there's some comparableness, but against things like cyber attack. So it is becoming a kind of normalised weapon, you know, and if you normalise something like that, eventually it is going to be used, you know, and, and that's the reality. So whatever the kind of debate about, you know, whether deterrence worked and whether it prevented anything or not, I mean, I, I, I don't believe it did, really, to be honest. But 
even if you believed that, the situation has now changed. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll certainly respond to the letter when I've read it in detail. I did, I did see it there. Um, I mean, I don't think that I've got a rosy view of the Lib Dems. I, I, just, I only said that they were better than Labour and Tories. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's interesting, um, and I've never voted Lib Dem, so I haven't got a kind of, you know, an interest in it. Um, when the... Um, what was it called? Not a, uh, a coalition government, you know, with the Tories and Lib Dems together from 2010. And various Lib Dems were in positions of, you know, cabinet positions and so on. And um, what was his name? Nick. Clegg. No, not, not Clegg. Nick Clegg. Nick, somebody else. Anyway, he became Sir Nick eventually. He became a, one of the ministers of defence. And he was responsible, oh, Nick Harvey, that was it. And he was responsible for kind of um, liaising within the Ministry of Defence about the nuclear stuff. And at that time, the Lib Dems had a bit more backbone on this. And I think they are probably being affected by sentiment around the Ukraine war. That would be my, my guess. Um, but actually, at that time, um, he was rather good in terms of you know trying to stir it up and not let the Tories just push the whole through thing thing through without any debate, and he was responsible for getting an alternative um, report from within the cabinet on whether or not Trident should be replaced. So that was that was quite interesting. I mean, not that it achieved that much, but nevertheless it did open up the debate around that. And the other thing is that. Um, with them in Parliament, in, in, in government, it, it, with the Tories, that was the time when a further round of reductions in our nuclear arsenal was announced. So it was from, that was the last time an, a, a reduction was announced. So it was from, it was something like from 220 down to 160 even, or 180 or 160, but quite a substantial drop. And that was, I think, through pressure from the Lib Dems, you know, that the Tories should actually do something about it. So through that, I know they did lots of terrible things and they sold out the students and all that sort of thing. But in, in that particular thing, I think they had a positive influence on the Conservative leadership of that coalition government and, you know, did bring about some change. But I think, yeah, I think they probably become a bit more spineless since then, if I could put it like that. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Can I, I ask a question about the way CND deals with this sort of thing. I've been absolutely fascinated listening to you talking about the different political parties. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name's Agnes Siegel. Um, I was fascinated listening to you talking about the way the different political parties work and like they're just immovable basically and um, we've talked about from the top and so on but we know from Jeremy Corbyn's experience
experience that being the top can't change things. And from the bottom, we know that the majority of people, in, let's say, in the Labour Party, don't want nuclear weapons. But as members of the Labour Party, we don't seem to be able to change things. Do you feel, as CMD, where you've got groups such as parliamentary CMD, that slowly you're able to eat away at the they that we're, none of the rest of us can influence. And if you can't, have you any idea how we as activists might attempt to identify those they and get at them? <laughs> um, well, I think that, I mean, first of all, just a little bit about parliamentary C and D. Um, I mean, it is, I think it's, it's quite a good thing, so to speak. It, it's a cross-party group. It doesn't have a conservative member, so it's not a formal all-party parliamentary group, but it's a cross-party group, and there are representatives from uh, all other parties there. And as you might expect, you know, from what Tim said about the nationalists and the Greens policies and so on, you know, they are very strong within it. But there are all, it also gives a space for Lib Dems, for example, who are anti-Trident but don't agree with their party leadership, so to speak, to have a voice and to be organised with others, you know, across the benches, so to speak. So it's, it's very positive like that. And all similarly with the Labour Party, you know, the party, lead, the party policy is one thing, but having the parliamentary CND group does provide a framework for them to express their views. Um, and even though um, Labour, Labour MPs have been kind of disallowed from criticising NATO on pain of losing the whip, that has not yet, fortunately, I hope it won't, been applied to members speaking out against nuclear weapons, you know, and it may be that because there is a quite a strong faith issue as well, you know, within, you know, the Quaker MPs, for example, and others of different faiths and or communities within faiths, you know, who have strong views. And that's the case in the Lords as well. So it does it does provide a framework. And also there are peers in parliamentary C and D as well as MPs. So that kind of sometimes you get a kind of bit of a barrier to communication between the two houses. I'm sure it's not intentional, but they just do their own separate business. But it does allow that communication to take place. And also because they are MPs they can request meetings um, to discuss things with ministers or even secretaries of state, you know, and also um, they put in their questions and all that in the normal kind of way, but they do have then, they can ask that the different committees, like the Defence Select Committee and so on, um, to raise certain things and investigate certain things. So they do, they are able to do quite a lot you know, and the people who are most involved are very, very committed to it and, and, and do a lot as well. Sometimes it's not as much as they would like or we would like, but I think it's, it's definitely very useful. And they always say, you know, how important it is that we lobby our own MPs, you know, because, you know, whether that's through a kind of email lobbying thing or going to see them directly, you know, because it does make a difference to hear from their constituents because as people, you know, MPs say, the only thing MPs care about is really what their constituents think because that shapes how they're going to vote, you know, so they, they will respond. So I think in terms of having the impact in Parliament, you know, putting that pressure on from the grassroots and, and having motions through CLPs, if you're in the Labour Party, for example, or you know other appropriate bodies in other parties, you know it can all help to raise the debate. Okay, now uh, because I'm chair and because it's nearly three o'clock, this is going to be the last question that's coming from me. <laughs> You've been campaigning, Kate, since for more than forty years on this issue. Um, if you are optimistic. What keeps you optimistic? What keeps you carrying on campaigning? Um, well, I, the thing that popped into my mind immediately was 
C and D members, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's that, uh, no disrespect to anyone who's not a C and D member, but that's the sort of collective thing, you know, the working together and knowing that you're not alone and being part of the movement and you can talk to people and share little successes and little failures and all that and do stuff together and share your vision of the world as well. And, you know, we can share that internationally as well. I think international links is something that's very important for me as well. I mean, this, uh, this morning I've been at the Future War Conference, which is a CND and Drone Wars conference over in Birkbeck College, um, about you know new forms of weaponry and technology and ethics of technology and stuff. Very interesting. And there was a guy from Germany, Lucas Wurl, from the International Engineers Group, and just talking about his experience of what they're doing and the different campaigns. And there's so much common ground with ours, you know, and we need to link up more because you just get a lot of strength from sharing, sharing the struggle together, I suppose. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk, um, pretty depressing in a way, <laughs> but, Sorry. but you know, we, we know many of the mm. facts mm. and we know that we've got to change them. Mm. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much, thank you people here in the hall and thank the people who are watching online now and hopefully in the future when we put it on the MORE website. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you.